In chapter 15, we are going to spend our time looking at different ways that infectious disease can be diagnosed. So we'll look at, we'll start out with specimen collection, and then we'll move into the different types of testing that, that can be done to um, find out what type of disease an individual has, or at least what type of infectious disease, and what the etiologic organism is that is causing the disease. There's really three main categories that we can put the types of tests into that we use to diagnose infectious disease. And that includes looking at phenotypic methods. So using the microscope and looking at the morphology and the gram staining of um, a bacteria that might be causing disease. Uh, utilizing biochemical assays to see which enzymes the organisms produce. Uh, we can use immunology, the power of immunology to do serological analysis. And then we can also look at the genetics of microorganisms using genotypic testing. Um, this is becoming more and more common and almost uh, used as a sole method of giving a definite identification of a, micro, or of a bacteria and viruses as well. Um, we'll look at each one of these individually in different uh, videos for this lab or for this um, chapter. Um, but what's really cool is together these three are usually used um, in conjunction with each other. And um, starting with phenotypic is usually the first basic one that type of testing that's done, and then you can go on to immunologic or uh, genotypic as well. And then. Um, these really, these three methods really can provide a unique profile for any bacteria, but also for viruses. Uh, you can use it for fungus, you can use it for parasites. So really any microorganism uh, can be identified or at least closely uh, close identified uh, using one or a combination of these three different types of testing. Recall from our genetics chapter that when we talk about phenotype, we're talking about some sort of um, expression of the genes that an organism has. And so when we're using a phenotypic method to identify a microorganism, we are actually looking at observable traits that we can see. This can either be done by using a microscope and viewing its structure, viewing its gram staining uh, properties. It can be um, done looking at enzymatic properties of a cell and what types of reactions it's able to carry out. Uh, phenotypic methods can include antibiotic um, testing, so sensitivity testing to see if an organism is susceptible or resistant to different antibiotics. Uh, and then you can also look at what type of environment it grows in. So does it grow in uh, environments that have oxygen? Does it require an environment that doesn't have oxygen? All of those different types of um, characteristics are considered to be phenotypic because they are related to the expression of the genes that an organism has. Any of the immunologic methods that we use to identify uh, microbes really has to do with an antibody antigen response. So antibody is going to be a protein that is produced by the human immune system that recognizes specific proteins sometimes carbohydrates as well. But antibodies can be made by humans to have a certain specificity. And this has been really great to include then in diagnostic testing because we can develop antibodies to recognize certain antigens. And if the, there is a reaction, then that means that that individual has that antigen and that antigen would be from some sort of pathogen. And so immunologic methods then are actually going to be um, anything that uses antibody antigen interaction um, looking for a specific pathogen. And this is often a lot easier to look for um, than um, looking for the microbe itself using a microscope because antigen and antibody interactions are very sensitive and can be used to find very tiny amounts of pathogen. 
And there's a lot of kits and uh, that are available in clinical lab or in diagnostic testing. And we call these rapid kits kits. So you're probably pretty familiar with um, the rapid group A strep test. You can go in, you can get a rapid strep test within 15 minutes. You know if you have strep or not. Um, mono, there's a rapid mono kit. Um, the rapid COVID testing is all done using immunologic methods. Genotypic methods are going to include anything that is going to be looking at the genome of the organism, whether we're looking for DNA or we're looking at RNA, those are going to be included in genotypic methods. Now, there are definitely some advantages of doing genotypic work. We also call this molecular work. Uh, number one, the organism doesn't have to be cultivated. It doesn't have to be grown. And sometimes organisms can't be grown in the lab. And so genotypic typing is the only way that can really feasibly be done. But other times, even if it could be grown in the lab, if you can um, do molecular work and find out if an organism is present within a couple hours versus, um, you know, like 24, 48 hours, which it takes for to grow in the lab, um, genotypic methane, um, Typing can cut off a lot of time. Um, and then it's also great um, for specificity. So we can know exactly what virus, what strain of virus, uh, what strain of bacteria uh, is present because molecular typing or genotype. Uh, genotypic typing is um, going to be very specific and get you right down to the species level. So there are a lot of advantages to molecular work. Uh, some of the disadvantages, I don't have them on the slide, but um, it can be a little bit more expensive. Not every lab is able to do molecular work, and so it isn't um, a go-to for every lab, but it definitely is one that is becoming increasingly more and more um, available in even the smaller labs. One of the things that we always say in the lab is that your results are only going to be as good as your specimen. And so it really, if we're gonna talk about identification of a microbe, it really all starts with proper specimen collection as well as proper storage and transport to the microbiology lab. Uh, if a sample is not collected properly or if it is not stored properly, the microorganisms that are causing the disease might not be viable and might not be able to be tested and, and so it really has to do with specimen collection and transport. Uh, number one above everything is aseptic technique really needs to be practiced when collecting specimens. When we're thinking about the human body and where these pathogens might be, we know that there is a normal microbiota pretty much everywhere on and in the body. And so being able to eliminate uh, contamination with normal flora is vital or even contamination with the environment as well. And so making sure that um, when a sample is collected, the site is prepped appropriately, and the best work is done to try to collect as sterile a specimen as possible. That being said, the container that the path or that the sample gets put into also needs to be sterile. So, um, you know, there are definitely approved laboratory containers uh, that get sent out swabs and cups and, and, and bags and different things, and only those can be utilized. Once you start collecting urine in a jelly jar, well, that really kind of um, doesn't help the lab determine which pathogen is actually causing disease or was it, you know, from the container itself. Um, and when collecting samples, it's important that only the area that's affected is collected. So like a skin scraping or a wound culture, um, care that's taken to avoid all the other area around it is very important because again, we don't want all the extra normal flora, um, causing, you know, masking the actual pathogen or even being a competitor to the growth and not even allowing the actual pathogen to grow. So proper specimen collection and transport are vital to getting um, accurate results in the microbiology lab. Here's an image from your text. It just is kind of an overview of all the different areas 
that specimens for microbiology analysis can be collected. And you can see it's, it's all kind of everywhere, right? So you can take skin, you can take cerebral spinal fluid, you can take feces, um, you can take from all the different um, access points into the body, like the vagina, the mouth, um, with, um, urine, um, and then you can take blood, you can take saliva, um, sputum from the lungs. There's all kinds of different samples that can be utilized for collection depending on where the symptoms are in the patient and which um, organ systems or which body systems are being affected, you know, where the pathogen is going to most likely be found. The first sample I want to draw attention to is sputum. I know sometimes I've I've heard people say sputum, but that's not that's not accurate. It's sputum. And this is not just spit. It is actually like this deep mucus that comes from within the lungs, the bronchi, and um, it is coughed up into a container. It can also be sucked out as well, but um care should be taken to really try to avoid saliva and, and, and all that spit when collecting a sputum sample because really that pathogen is going to be down in the lower respiratory system and that's what the sputum is trying to, to get out. Lots of times this, um, it's kind of a, a viscous um, semi-fluid um, it's not really um, chunky. It's really gross. I, I think it's one of the grossest samples ever, but um, it's going to trap a lot of the microbes. And so it's a really great sample um, when trying to diagnose what type of pneumonia a patient might have or something on that line. I don't know how deep we have to go into this slide. It's urine. <laughs> um, probably something everybody's pretty familiar with. I think the important things to bring up uh, in relation to this course is that when we're talking about collecting a urine sample for microbiology analysis, uh, there's two types of urine sample collections. There can be a catheter um, collection and there can be a clean catch midstream. The clean catch is typically what anybody can do um, and probably what you have done if you've ever had to leave a urine sample at um, the clinic uh, for like a physical or, or something like that. And the clean catch comes from the um, idea that you would use a like a almost like a Buffalo Wild Wings BevNap, you know, like those little wet moist towelettes <laughs> and you would clean the exterior uh, anatomy. And then you would start peeing a little bit, and then you would pee in the cup, and then you would finish out in the toilet, right? And so it's called a clean catch midstream if you want to be super technical. And this is aiming at um, reducing the potential of getting uh, normal flora from the external anatomy into the sample. With a catheter, um, you can have like an indwelling calf where it can be pulled from a bag or something. Or you could do a straight cath, which is just an immediate go in um, with a, a catheter, pull out some urine out of the bladder, and then put it into a tube. Um, so those are different um, methods of collecting urine samples that can be sent to the lab. Um, and then the other uh, <clears throat> thing on here doesn't really have anything to do with urine, but um, swabs can be used to collect um, around like the vagina or urethra or cervix can all be done using a swab or some sort of um, collection stick. Samples from the skin can be collected. Uh, usually it's going to be like a skin scraping where you take a scalpel and you scrape little flakes off and you, you put it into a sterile cup. Um, you can do a punch where it will take a section of the, of the skin. Uh, you can also do a swab if there is uh, going to be like a, a surface wound or a, a surface um, boil or pustule or, or something like that. And then you would use a swab that is um, similar to what is shown where there's going to be some sort of transport media in there to keep the, the swab moist. And then it's going to be uh, protected though and sterile on the inside. And that red cap pulls off, you'd swab and you'd put it right back into the container without touching any other surfaces to try to maintain that aseptic collection technique. 
Oftentimes when patients come in and they're very sick and they are suspect of a meningitis or sepsis, um, then sterile body fluids can be collected. And these include things like blood, cerebral spinal fluid. And care is very important so that there's not a contamination with the skin that as the needle goes in. So collecting these sterile body fluids is going to require puncturing the skin and then in through the tissue with the needle and making sure that that area is prepped really well to remove any normal flora on the skin is absolutely vital. Um, and so, yeah, um, if you've ever collected blood cultures or you've been in on a spinal tap, you know that there's betadine. Uh, being used, there's alcohol preps being used, and there's a lot of scrubbing to make sure that the surface is completely clear of any normal flora before that needle enters the body. We've talked about a lot of different types of samples, but there can really be all any kind, right? And so I just have this here to show you that this is kind of the default um, collection device that we have for microbiology labs. Uh, it's not going to include for urine or blood or any of those that we mentioned before, except for skin and wounds. But this swab is pretty universal in that it can be used to collect all kinds of samples all over the body. Again, it is essential that it is collected appropriately, stored appropriately, and transported appropriately in order to culture the microbes that the um, that might be causing the disease. And so if we're thinking there's going to be an uh, anaerobic organism or an organism that can't um, be around oxygen, then this has to be put into a, um, an environment then that is going to be without oxygen in it, right? So you'd have to put it into some sort of container. Um, if it uh, needs to be, you know, we need to keep these cold, so maybe they need to be put on ice, um, but it is vital that transport is done uh, appropriately. Otherwise, we might not be able to pick up the microorganism if it, if it can't even make it through transport. And the other vital thing with any type of sample sent to the lab, and this isn't just with microbiology, uh, but labeling absolutely has to be labeled appropriately. There has to be um, a location of the site, time of collection. Um, maybe there needs to be like, you know, if it's the arm, there's a wound on the arm, tell exactly it's the upper right arm wound, you know, like be as detailed as you can in the location of the sample, because that is only going to help the lab as they try to cultivate and report on any findings. An important piece that I want to leave you guys with on this part of the lecture is that remember that the microbiology lab often, unless it's a rapid test, often we'll have to grow up microorganisms. And so that could take 24 hours. It could take 48 hours. Um, it could take, if we're looking at a fungus or a slow growing microorganism, it could take a week or so. And so remember that um, unless you're doing a rapid test, you really can't order much stat in the microbiology lab because things just take time to grow the microorganism. So do know that time is required for testing as well as sensitivity testing and um, uh, but like gram stains and rapid testing, you know, those can be ordered stat because they can be turned around within 20 minutes, a half hour. Um, but some of those longer ones, it could take days or weeks until results get back.